Hello everybody, welcome today. Spring is in full effect. Spring is here. Officially it was March 21st, but we are right smack dab in the middle of spring. I hope you had a great uh, time last week, vacation. Uh, we didn't get to see you. I was out camping with my family. I hope you had a good time. I uh, wanted to mention that the Film Scoring Academy right now is having a sale for spring until the end of the month. Uh, it's 30% off absolutely everything. Just make sure you use the code SPRINGSCORING on checkout and uh, you'll be able to grab any of the courses that you've been looking forward to grabbing. So uh, here we are, you know, and uh, we're joined today with uh, Dallas Crane on my left. Hey, guys. And Kyle Juhas. Hey, guys. And uh, as usual, we're going to be talking about scoring. Yes. Right. Happy end game weekend to all. <laughs> yes. All are, we are in the end game. Yeah, we are now in the end game. <laughs> We're in the post game now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <over>. yeah. <laughs> post game. I think, yeah, I, I have some things to talk about about that. Well, but first, uh, Josh Tackett asks, uh, what's the most realistic solo violin uh, library that uh, you've used? He asked that to a group. Hmm. Um, Josh Rousseau recommended the Amber Tone Joshua Bell. It's really, really great. I don't know if you've got a chance to use it, but it's absolutely outstanding. And uh, also there's the Spitfire Solo Strings Violins, which sound pretty nice. And there's all of there's a couple different solo violins in the LAS, LA Scoring Strings Library, which, which is the one that I probably would highly recommend. Um, and there's also, uh, the name is escaping me, uh, I think it's called Emotional uh, Violin. Yeah, Emotional. Yeah, is that the right one? Yeah. Uh, also, yeah, the Joshua Bell. I had a, I had an experience where I worked with just the, um, the East West, I think it was either Goal, it, it was just, it came with that, you know, cheapo bundle. And it's it's very awkward to use, but the great thing is you have like a million key switches with different variants of articulation. And so what I did for a particular violin track was I studied, you know, the great violin concertos, particularly a Ravel's Sagan, which is kind of like the gypsy jazz violin thing. And there's a lot of um, different techniques in it. That's why it's like a great encyclopedia of violin technique and how it sounds. So That's I really what I was going to say. That one is kind of good for gypsy, yeah. Yeah, and so... What, what's great about listening for that kind of stuff is, you know, you know what it sounds like for a bow to go up and to go down and, you know, how it moves and all those different nuances. And so then I went with this clunky, you know, east-west thing and, you you know, I played the melody and then I went through painstakingly and added the different key switches basically for every note. Um, and then you do some CC curve, you know, correction and it ends up actually pretty nice. Right, um, and I fooled nice. a couple of people. Oh, they thought it was actually real authentic. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. And that's kind of the you know, goal. so <laughs> I, I think that's that's really important with, with any kind of solo instrument is you know how it moves between the notes. Because with a group you can kind of fudge it because, you know, every member is moving a little differently and it blends together, but with a solo instrument you should really know, you know, how they can articulate different notes and what you might consider to be wrong might actually be more characteristic and interesting mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. in the sound. Um, <clears throat> Peter Gzardo, hey Peter, recommends also the Chris Hine violin, which just has so many parameters, you know, 25 plus parameters during any notes performance that it really gives you a ton of control. Uh, also, uh, that was another vote for the Joshua Bell, another vote for the Joshua Bell, another vote for the Joshua Bell. Yeah, I heard Joshua Bell's a decent violinist. Yeah, yeah, it seems to me. <laughs> and uh, another vote from Christian Lovato for Joshua Bell. Uh, somebody uh, asks, uh, oh, also then Josh followed up and said, okay, so how about cello? And uh, there's a few there as well. There's also the uh, Ember Tone uh, cello, which I, I believe that is the one called Emotional Cello. Yeah, I know there's an Emotional Cello. And then there's a couple by Tina Guau. I think yeah. there's three now by Tina Guau. And and those are outstanding. Yeah, those, those are really good. So we've got a lot of options there. Also, uh, Gio Hone uh, recommends the Swam Violin from Audio Modeling. I personally am not in love with that one. Um, I think probably Audio Modeling's best thing that they've done is their brass libraries. But um, it does give you a lot of control. I mean, you have bow positions and, and, and all of that. So that's pretty nice. Great. Yeah. 
that's a that's quite a few options to sift through I think yeah and I at think some point it can be taste and what you're looking for uh, in the functionality of a solo if you just want to kind of play it through and you're fine with getting 80% of the way maybe you want one with less key switches and less parameters you want one that just kind of generally sounds good you know if you're doing like solo just footballs the whole time you know maybe uh-huh. you don't have to be so particular with <laughs> some of the uh, the higher end libraries yeah cool uh, now Paula Kantachin asks uh, when you're composing for a short film but this could really go towards any film do you usually score all the scenes in one project or do you open different projects for each scene and it kind of goes back to like when I started out I have a lot of experience with the either or on that and I, I from my experience uh, I definitely uh, recommend you try to have all of your music up at one time. So the all the scenes in one project option. Um, when, when I was starting out, I started on this program called Studio Vision Pro from Opcode Systems. I was one of the first users. And it allowed you to have all of your different cues up. Uh, you could uh, even have variations on cues. And you could eventually do things like... Um, reference certain bars from certain cues um, programmatically so that you construct a new version of a cue from existing parts of other cues and that allowed you to make new cues very quickly because then you can do something called print it you click print it and it would create a new cue with all the information that you just had there and you could go in and then edit all that but it wouldn't edit the original you actually had the choice. You could you could have them dependent or non-dependent. Pretty damn nice way That's to go. Sweet. So I got kind of spoiled on that, and then uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but then Gibson bought Opcode Systems, and in yeah, a kind of an antitrust to. lawsuit, just killed the program. And to this date, uh, you know, other programs are just catching up to where that program was 10 or 15 years ago. So that's a little bit of a tragedy. But I, uh, through the years, moved on and started to use Logic and Mastered Logic and uh, Cubase and Nuendo. But I've ended up at, uh, in Digital Performer from Mark of the Unicorn. And that one uh, does that. It allows you to have all your cues up at one time. Logic does not although they've kind of answered that a little bit lately by having sort of project versions. But that's not quite the same thing. You can't have different cues up at the same time. So let's say you had three cues and you wanted to see how you use them recently, like because they had certain themes of, in them being called. And you could have them all up, check them out back and forth, and then now you could go into your next cue and write it in a way that would be most appropriate for the for the evolution of the score. Uh, so Logic uh, doesn't quite give you that ability even with their versioning uh, system. Um, and uh, Cubase also does not, and they have some versioning as well, but they, they do not. They sort of, you can do like, kind of like track folders and then versioning of those. And it's not, again, not quite the same thing because you can't see them at the same time. Uh, and even then it's kind of a workaround. But, but Digital Performer, and Mark of the and uh, Opcode Systems Studio Vision Pro used to be head to head, so they almost have the same features. Uh, so Digital Performer has that; it has the ability for you to see all your different yeah, the uh, chunks cues up at the same time. So, based on my experience, I find that to be the best way to go to have them up all at the same time because you can do all that referencing. Your cues, otherwise, they just they're too standalone, and they it won't represent your your entire masterwork of a score for an entire project as well as they could when you're not able to kind of like just double check how you did your counterpoint and your different you know voice leading and uh, melodic contouring on the previous times that you referenced a particular theme or action motif or whatnot. So I think it's, it really raises your bar of mastery as a composer to be able to do that. Do you have to do that? No, but in my experience, it makes you a much better composer. Hmm. Yeah, and, and especially I wanted to add this with uh, with short films. Um, generally, you know, and especially with beginners, when you're you're working on a f- just getting the sense of working on a film, your sense of time scale is is really skewed, and you don't really have a good sense of how music flows and evolves over time. So when you're working on a short film, 
the uh, the error, the tendency to error is to make all these microscopic cues, you know, like 30 second cues, or this cues 15 seconds, you know, and you're trying to get 20 cues out of a short film that's maybe like five or 10 minutes long. You should actually be working the other way is you have a short film and you should be trying to make it you know, the lo as long of a cue as possible. You want to spread out that time and unify it because it's such a short film and you need the unity and when you're breaking into smaller bits and already short production, um, you're just kind of working against yourself there. So that's that's what I would say is have a short film that's just, you know, e even just like one cue all the way through or it could be, you know, two cues. If it's like a 20 minute film, you know, you can do a few more cues. I think a lot of people get around the uh, <clears throat> original issue that I was mentioning that um, Nuendo and Logic and Cubase have, which is that they can't, you know, give you the ability to have multiple cues up at the same time. They get around that by doing the one timeline approach. And that can be a real issue. Let's talk about some of those problems, for oh, instance. Oh, yeah. Um, Dead space between cues. If you change the tempo of a cue that's prior to a cue that you're working on or one that you've already completed, go back, maybe there's a revision or whatever, now the entire timeline moves for the rest of the movie. It's this whole one timeline, right? If you change a meter, if you cut anything out, if you change the tempo anywhere, it's all screwing up the times of every other piece. But on top of that, that's still not an answer for you to be able to say, write a revision to one piece and still have the previous revision, which people who use Nuendo, Cubase, uh, Logic, and Pro Tools just aren't spoiled enough to really understand how powerful it can be. But it's nice to be able to have even your different revisions up at the same time. Okay. Your alternates, because right. you can see, okay, well, which works better? You can just A-B some stuff, you know? I mean, the filmmaker has come over, and you guys can check out, you know? Hey, well, here's, you know, five different ways I handled that transition. Click, yeah, click, it's, it's not even, click. like, revision updates. It's, like, actual versions mm -hmm. of pieces. Like you said, you can have two or three ways you're approaching the scene before the client even gets a look at it. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to bounce between those, maybe there's something they like from each of them. Yes, exactly. So I don't I don't really support, I mean, everybody experiments with that once in their life, the one timeline approach. Yeah. And it's a disaster. Yeah, you basically all come to the conclusion that there needs to be like, you know, timeline that is measurable and then you need this flexible kind of non-scoring time that will expand and contract to fill the gap between two different cues. And then if they if they had just that one function, then the one timeline idea would make sense. Because then you can have a cue change tempo and the other cue would just still start at the same t um, the same uh, time code and then the flexible time in between would just, you know, fill in the space accordingly. So that's kind of the conclusion. I think everyone reaches going through the, the one timeline approach. The other thing is um, to get around it, you could just say you're going to do the whole film in one tempo, and then all you have to worry about is uh, a few uh, time signature changes here and there to you know make sure you start your cue at the top of a bar, and that's about it. So one one tempo all the way through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's could definitely. be a. I mean, it's not a bad restriction. It's definitely effective. You know, if you do like Goldsmith style. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's good for music editing later too because yep. you can reference bars that are uh, from different moments in a different queue uh, or even the same queue but they're if they're at the same tempo well, it's faster music editing as well. it's very true yeah exactly you get more of that that just yeah it's just uh, much more seamless you don't have to go in there and try to do any kind of uh, time compression expansion you can just kind of just oh boop, you know place it in and I'm good now again little you know fade in fade out so yeah, yeah that's very true uh, and again, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and post them into your uh, social media discussion area there. Um, we are watching all the platforms and able to um, field your, your topics, issues, questions, feedback. It uh, would be great to hear from you. Um, speaking of having filmmakers over, um, you know, what are some of the ways that we can connect with filmmakers in a stronger way, create a stronger bond right have better you know connection with those filmmakers when they come over well I, I think we have to realize our first primary um, issue we have to resolve is that we are filmmakers who come up through the wrong um, discipline we're kind of you know the uh, red-headed stepchild that is thrown out and we're adopted by some you know whatever across the country we're growing up in music <laughs> but we're 
actually filmmakers, and so we didn't grow up in the same filmmaking discipline as filmmakers, so we have to resolve that, and that would mean we should become familiar with the uh, practices of the filmmaking community, of actually making a film. Yes. Um, and that can be, I, I think, from the beginning, it should be mostly just technical issues, understanding how cameras work, how framing works, what, what you think about in the scenes, you know, how a director goes through dialogue and script, you know, and then you can get into the technical stuff like managing crew or, you know, uh, shot schedules, you know, shot lists, that kind of thing, A teams, B teams, you know. All yeah, that, that speaks less to say what you've got to do yeah. and more to just maybe understanding all the pressure that the filmmaker that's over. Yeah, understanding like, you know, it's fine for them to take another week to film five seconds of footage because you know everything yeah. going behind it. But yeah, definitely know the art side of it first right and that can be for like actual filmmaking you know so with, with a camera and actors or it can be you know with animation if you're interested in, in animation so you should know the frame rates of animation you know the aspect radi ratios how you convert it you know onto television or you know you could know about flash animation macromedia flash 5 you know or flash 4 um, all these different historical methods of animating would Flip be very interesting. <laughs> yeah, you, you should that's the easiest one. You get a you know, three by five index cards, you spend like yeah. an hour and just animating. Yeah. It's super easy. You yeah, know, yeah. get a get a sense of of how they feel the characters and how, you know, like eight frames per second animation feels compared to twelve frames per second or twenty four. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how much more costly it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> In terms of note cards. <laughs> yeah, I exactly. So I think that's that's interesting to study and, and very informative because generally when they're studying their styles, they're probably studying, they're probably uh, absorbing the different, maybe even like musical styles that come along with that genre. You know, So if you're into like thin line animation, then um, you would know what thin line animation directors would expect in their soundtracks and you can either subvert that or at least address it and address your music in a way that resonates with them mm -hmm. so yeah just get to know get to know what's going on yeah be be an insider i think that's that's my bar anyway personally is yeah. if i can speak about something as somebody who is on the inside yeah. having done it experienced it known it learned it you know a lot of people you know love john williams they want to be john williams and um so they want to learn how to conduct, they want to learn how to orchestrate, they want to learn how to compose, they want to learn how to write, they want to learn how to play piano, they want to learn some jazz voicings, they want to learn voice leading, counterpoint. But um, John Williams also knows how movies are made. He sits in front of a movieola, at least in the old days, he sits in front of a movieola and would s physically have a film physically in front of him he understands that it's, it's an assembly of a bunch of frames that are in a sequence and yeah. you shoot them and there's he roughs and he doesn't use beats per minute for his tempos no. he uses frames and fractions of frames right right frames per second uh, frames uh, per minute or whatnot yeah mm -hmm. yeah totally so I mean you know it's you, you gotta get out of your um, like crap shell or whatever you want to call it and you know open up you know your universe to what you're doing if you're writing classical music you don't ever have to worry about how any of these visual narrative mediums are constructed yeah you, you know but even if you think if you think about a classical musician they need to know the composing but what else do you need do they need to know they need to know how stages work how orchestras work how orchestras and their librarians work, you know, how to get a concert going and what the expectations are, you know, for advertising and revenue and stuff. So they still yeah. have to know the people they work with. Yeah. Because their content ultimately has to be designed for that platform. Yeah, you're only going to do better in life if you if you know more all encompassing of what you need to know, you Yeah. Know? It's only going to help, you know, and you want to do better in life. So it's a good idea. Yeah, I think so. And it, it's 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 uh it's very interesting um, when you start digging into it because it's as you get a sense of what film is, it's going to be inspiring you as a f as a creative to interact with that medium. You're not just writing this music in this blank void and then 
warping it onto the film via some director you send files to. You know, you're actually interacting with the medium and you can have this push and pull. You can say, you know, you can request different things from the filmmaker or you can uh, anticipate things from the filmmaker and, you know, play on that with your music. And if you don't know anything about the film process or about scenes, you know, then you can't really uh, do that. For example, um, this is a little more sound effects, but I think the concept is the same. Um, there's just this uh, short little sound effects thing I was doing, maybe like 30 seconds, and you see this just uh, the sleeping grasshopper. He just sits there and sits there and sits there, and then suddenly a foot shows up and kind of stomps next to it and scares him, so he jumps off, right? And that's the scene. Um, and then you, you know, so a sound effects guy without any experience, and th this is all um, metaphor for a music, but the sound effects guy would look at it and say, okay, foot stomps, foot sound effect cricket sleeping, cricket sound effect. But if you know film and you know narrative anticipation and stuff, the uh, the smart sound designer would actually go to the beginning of that scene where you can't see anything and start doing quiet footsteps and start building them up. And um, and actually what I did was kind of a Monty Python thing where there'd be a little bit of footsteps and then it'd stop. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when, when you listen to something and your attention is on, you hear it, and then when your attention fades, you stop hearing it. And then you hear the footsteps a little louder, you know, a little kind of comedic thing, right? You know, the anticipation is building up. And then you finally see the foot and you already know what it is. There's an interesting shot in Taxi Driver, uh, Martin Scorsese's, I think it was his third film, where uh, Robert De Niro's in a hallway uh, uh, and you can see the street kind of like in the distance. And he's on close up at a phone. He puts a coin in the phone and then he makes a phone call to somebody and starts to have a conversation. Martin Scorsese then's camera moves away from the phone and Robert De Niro and just looks down the hallway for the whole conversation. Almost as if you were, you know, somebody um, next to him and just didn't want to intrude on his conversation. Yeah, and just kind of like waited till the end of the conversation. He gets off the phone, you hear the hang up, ching, you know, and, and then he comes into the frame that's now moved over and then walks uh, down the hallway. You know, I mean, that's a reverse of what you just said. It was like sound now is leading the visual astray and the visuals playing the story outside of the story. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's a reverse of what you and, just said. And you've got to know the meaning of a scene to do that. You know, there's that, I keep forgetting the name of this effect, but it was Alfred Hitchcock who, who would always talk about it, that the editing is the art of cinema. And so you can place one image that by itself is meaningless and edit mm. it next to another image, you know, sequentially, and suddenly there's meaning it's across a the it's images. It's called a something effect. Yeah, some Russian. It's not the Kuleshov effect, is it? it? It might be. Okay, okay. Yeah, some Russian thing. So oh, yeah, yeah. It basically says that the, the edit between the first image and the second image, those two images combined actually create a whole new communication yeah. which is another message yeah. so as a film as a film composer you need to know that you know maybe you're staring at an empty hallway or blades of grass or you're staring at something that's just visually uninteresting but you have to know in the context of the film what a director is doing with that shot right because there's going to be a you know, the more boring the shot is, the more interesting the music has to be because there's something going on that you're not seeing that needs to be communicated. Exactly. You know, and that's, that's when you study film. Um, you've got to know what those moments are, right? You've got to know what, what the director is anticipating. If you're just a reaction composer and you don't really know what visuals mean besides the, the obvious you know, surface level narrative that's going on. You know, you see a character run and you think the narrative character is running. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a lot harder to score right, right. that scene um, for its meaning. I got a question for you uh, coming from the uh, audience, yeah. uh, Kyle. Um, the name is uh, Joe O'Leaf. He asks, when working with orchestral scores, what kind of mastering techniques do you apply there? And uh, how do they differ from, say, mastering a a pop song. I think that's a great question. I haven't really done as much mastering like on else. the mastering level, right? Yeah, on the mastering level, I um, have some things I can say. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I think yeah, I think you have more, probably better uh, answer for that than I would. Yeah, but but definitely they're different worlds. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because I think I, at least from my approach, if I was doing a mastering for an actual just straight up orchestral score, uh, it's very, I would say, very transparent. I would say for the most part, I wouldn't be yes. doing too much to really emphasize any kind of bass or really, I mean, obviously you're trying to match a certain dB, a certain decibel level, 
um, bring it, but really it's you, you're not going to want to overly compress, you're not going to want to squash your, your dynamic range, which I think is pretty much kind of what the almost a key element of doing a major pop recording or a major a master of a pop recording is, is you want to obviously bring down that dynamic level you want to have the floor and the and the uh, ceiling kind of come a little more closer so you're getting more of that squish yeah. kind of pulsating sound yeah it's like radio that it, with pop you don't want to touch the dial at all yeah you so classical yeah. music it's very much expected that you you move yeah. the dial up and and down to whatever you want because they want to keep the actual dynamic exactly thing. exactly so uh, what i could recommend is um like you said you wouldn't want to overly compress uh, but when it comes to mastering, you do want to do com some form oh, yeah. of compression Absolutely. that's inaudible, whether or not that's a fader ride yes. technique or if it's uh, you got. And that's really not about bringing levels down. That's more about bringing lower levels up. Um, because when when a, when a soundtrack, when anything, any material is mastered, it um, needs to needs to play. In a lot of different environments, yes. for a lot of different situations, a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different atmospheres. And there's often competing sounds in people's listening environments. And so you want that material to sort of, you don't want to lose material in any one particular moment. So you, so that's one thing you want to focus on. And, and another thing in mastering is you want to get the, you don't want to do a whole bunch, whole bunch of EQ to the actual track itself but you do want to make sure that your high end is crystal crystal clear yes. up to 20 kilohertz and you want to make sure that your low end is highly controlled you don't want to have that flying all over the place and that's what you might want to really pay attention to keeping your your low end um, under control um, but another thing is in soundtracks uh, especially with hybrid score uh, when you're bringing in modern uh, instrumentation into the or orchestra as well, you want to apply a lot of audio care and processing at the mixing stage. Right, right. So that's where you might give a lot of sort of pre-master thoughts right. to all the different elements that you've got, all the different tracks you've got going on. Um, I could think like, you know, you might want to do things where adding an extra octave of bass into some of the bass material, especially into some of the modern instruments, um, uh, exciters, uh, um, there's, there's certain plugins that can add sort of life to some of the perhaps synth patches yes. if you're using actual synth or whether they're analog or digital. You can just give like some more overtone experience into the thing. So then when it gets to that mastering point for mastering the soundtrack of it, you know, it's already pretty much there and you just got to take care that it's it's not... Uh, one of the things that uh, I used to do when mastering is you have a, a white noise machine or a pink noise machine playing at certain levels and then you listen you can do this in a couple there's a couple different ways to do this but you have the white noise machine playing in the room at the same time as you're doing your mastering so you can see if you're losing any material mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you're losing material you are losing that material in certain listening critical listening environments mm -hmm. you know you can also kind of simulate that uh, by turning your music way 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 down to where you you kind of can't even hear it anymore and what you do here is now really the thing that's too loud. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so at that point, you know, you, you either take that down or bring up some of the other stuff uh, until you can hear it again, and then now you can bring it back up and you get a good balance. And that can also work for mixing as well. It's not just mastering, but you know, you know, you want to, with mastering, you want to achieve like a really good balance. Yes. Exactly. Sonically, dynamically, dimensionally. You know, you might be able to play play with the stereo image as well. You know, this is something you do in mastering. And, and in mastering, you're also trying to get all the tracks to sound like they're identical. Yes, exactly. So you, you want to bounce from track two to track seven and A, B. You want to A, B all the combinations. There's a track that's too low, bring it up. If that one can't be brought up more, bring this one down. Uh, you know, apply some limiting. Um, you know, check the EQ sonic signatures between all the different cues. Mastering, mastering is a whole kind of... Field that took me a, the, a decade, you know, it is. to it's, master. It, it, it really is one of those things where people get mixing and mastering confused a lot of the time, and they usually think they're the exact same thing. And, and I think what you're, what you just mentioned is exactly right. It's mastering is almost a 
you're kind of bringing out all the exaggerations of what the Knicks was. So you're trying all those little techniques, all those little effects or ear candy that you're hearing or even the compression you did in the actual mix itself or the, you know, the actual like filter changes. Uh, you're just trying to exactly trying to bring them up to a set standard sort of audible level where everything's crystal clear, everything is up to a kind of just a proper listening level, you know. So like, like you mentioned, every single track sounds the exact same. You go from seven to one to two to you know eight, and everything. Oh, it's, it's the it's the exact same dB level for the most part. Essentially, it's it's you're getting that seamless recording experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a global. Exactly, it's, it's just like a global, a, yeah. You know, mixing your very track to track and mm -hmm. mastering is unifying and preparing for actual, you know, consumption. So mixing, yeah, I mean, to be a mixing engineer, you kind of have, you're basically like an audio project manager. Yeah, essentially, yeah. In a way, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're the guy that comprehensively puts it all together. That's what mixing is. Yes. You're mixing it. <laughs> exactly. You know, there might be guys who can make sure that each track sounds good. It's just not the same as mixing, though. Right. It's a whole right. other ball of wax, whole other ball game. The mixing engineer, yeah, can start to take that into account. It can go in, do some fine surgery, fix this here, and fix that there because it's going to affect the global picture. Exactly. Of the audio, but uh, yeah, that's you know, I can definitely try and get better at uh, being uh, comprehensive, you know, right. looking at things in a global aspect. That's a very good point. It's smart too. I mean, most mixing engineers, if you're good mixing engineers, they're going to always keep that in mind. They're always going to keep that mastering process in mind. So never you, 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 you that's obviously why we're always so that's such absolutely a true stickler for you know clipping your track you know because then we're always making sure that we're going to have enough headroom for the actual mastering stage so right you bring up you know to a certain decibel level so that's why usually i think the biggest things someone's doing a mix at home they haven't mastered it yet and they'll put it up against a, a commercially you know released song and like I, why it's so low in volume well, it hasn't been mastered yet it hasn't been brought up to that kind of mm -hmm. that set standard of uh listening uh kind of volume that you know all CDs, MP3, you know, MP3s, everything kind of has nowadays. Yeah, with, um, is it safe to say, I'm, I'm just trying to think like, yeah. in, in very general terms, mixing, you kind of almost start from like, you know, inf negative infinity dB and you start adding things and bringing them in, you know, up till the actual level that they're in. So you're almost, it's all subtractive. You're saying how much you need to subtract from everything and then mastering, you can start boosting. That's a, that's, a, that's a great way to put it too, actually. I think a lot of people, they kind of forget that. They forget more of the boost instead of cuts. And it's the, it's, it's the exact opposite. It's cuts over boosts. You want to look for more of that. Okay, this is way too boomy. Take this away. These highs are way too shimmering. They're, they're, they're like piercing my ear. Let's take those down. And it's true. I think people, they kind of forget that. They just It's more of like, oh, let me boost my bass up to here, you know, to... 10 dB, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, at, at 100, and you're like, well, it's now it's just, you know, and the whole, yeah. you know, especially when it gets mastered, that's going to be way more pronounced, and it's just so, things to I'll, keep in mind. I have another good tip, too. Uh, you should future-proof when you're mixing and mastering. Um, number one, when you're mixing, uh, it would be a good idea to output some different channelization versions of the final output, mm -hmm. like kind of like pre-stems, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, effects, no mm -hmm. effects. And also, like, it can, it can be a good idea to output a 24-bit, or if you can, 32-bit mix down at maybe more than 48 kilohertz, maybe 96, 96. kilohertz, yeah. Or, or more if you like, you know, future-proof, future-proof it. You know, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. They might use those higher resolutions to engage a particular plugin, which looks at the waveform better and right. downsamples it much better, you That's know. True. So you just don't know. Just, so it's a good idea. It's a very good tip both in the mixing stage and in the mastering stage to output at resolutions that are much, much higher than what's currently the current practice. Then you can archive the project and you can always have those ready to go right. for whatever situations. And It'll last the next 50 years if you do it. Yeah, and also if you have any plug-in failures or anything, you know, any kind of transportation where you're not able to access the plug-in that was originally on the track. If you have a, an effects version of it, then yes. a dry version as well. Right, yes. You know, you're not locked into either. Print your effects, provide those separately if necessary. Really, really great tip, yeah. Uh, so uh, does everybody understand what, what Dallas was just getting at? So if you, if you have some plugins that are, that are adding some things that maybe later you might want to tweak a tiny bit, you might want to separate the actual difference into a separate track. So, I mean, the obvious one would be reverb. So you print the reverb of a particular track onto another track, and now you don't even need the plug-in. You know, freeze all your tracks, whatever program you know you're in. Just freeze them all so that you're you're not plug-in dependent. 
right. because in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, when you're going to do that 25 year anniversary album edition, uh, you're not stuck. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. And I guess the other part of future proofing, when you talked about archiving a project, um, some things I know, like just off the top of my head, like Omnisphere 2. Uh, multi-instrumental um, patch saves saves are in a particular spot um, on the on the computer. It's within the library, within like application support. So basically, it's separate from where your project file actually is. Okay. So when you're doing archiving, you should be aware of that, and also make sure that gets into your archiving. You know, so you finish a project and you archive. What are you going to do? You're going to put your project file there. You're going to have your your like WAV files and your audio files. You can get your uh, plug-in patches and multis, you know, um, if you have particular like VEP instances or servers, you can have it there. You don't have to save the samples or anything, but just the, the chaining so that if you lose, you know, anything else, as long as whatever's in the folder, you're able to uh, recreate it. And then, um, you know, just different stuff, uh, plugins, you know, if you do custom plugins, save them. You yes, know, exactly. Save yeah. them as their own preset and then load those into the folder. Um, and then any kind of final product. And I like to put I, like an archive version of the film, if I can get it, put it in there so I actually know what, what it was going with, too. Right. You know, right. just everything, you just close it up nice, you know, and then you can put it away and forget about it. And it's, it's all there. I think it's true, too. That's what you mentioned, even just saving like your side chains and your I.O. I think that's extremely important because I think we've all had those instances where you pull up a project or a session file on your DAW and it's nothing maps, nothing matches the outputs obviously to yours because it was recorded somewhere else or, you know, the mix obviously was done somewhere else. Um, so, but yeah, including that, it doesn't just, it'll save whoever you send it to a ton of time. It really will. Like, they can go through pulling, oh, this is what, this is where all your saved I.O. settings will just import these now and bam. I don't have to, don't have to go through and kind of yeah. figure out what you were doing. So. Yeah, and even having like uh, CC data at the yes. beginning of every one of your tracks, you know, because sometimes I've, I've caught myself doing this where I'm working like an atmosphere patch or something and it's, you know, I've moved it somewhere and I haven't um, noted that in the, the automation and so then when I reopen the project, it sounds different. I realize, oh, I didn't actually, you know, catalog that yes. initial start position. So, so that's, that's um, important too. Kim Goldbranson asks, uh, and how should you take the listening environment in the cinema into account when you mix? And you don't really know how your mix would translate. Well, um, let me switch over to me. You uh, want to just have experience with what are the good sonics that you want to have for your delivery, you know, files. So most uh, mix houses, you know, whoever's doing the final mix, the dubbing stage, will reject the production quality of your tracks if they if they if they aren't meeting any particular minimum standards that need to be met. Um, but you don't really have to worry too much about that except for the fact that the more you know probably the smarter your delivery tracks can be so that they don't get all manipulated to hell uh it just in order to save them grotesquely yeah deformed. like warped yeah so y you one of the things that they're going to do is, is kind of like what i mentioned before is they're going to make sure that your tracks aren't you know wildly out of control everywhere and they're all, also not really muddy and imperceptible you know they they're gonna want. They're gonna do a good mixing dub stage. Is going to treat your tracks what they call what they call sweetening, um, in a way that's uh, beneficial for the final cinematic experience of the audience. You know, if I had to give you a tip as a composer, what to do in order to have your music in a cinematic experience work best for the audience. The one l biggest tip I could give you is don't write music in the frequency range where people are talking in the movie if the audience is supposed to be listening to the dialogue of what the people are saying. Just do some stuff in the highs and the lows, and then when they stop talking, then bring in those mid instruments. Yeah, the, the worst is to have like a center field oboe solo going on during a dialogue oh, moment or something. Yeah. You know? Or vibraphone that it leaks like crazy. <laughs> I can't turn the vibraphone down enough. Don't don't ever record. And this is these are things that I've been taught by multiple mentors. Don't ever record glockenspiel mm -hmm. 
pretty much a xylophone I'll add to that in my experience. And vibraphone without extreme baffling if not just, you know, do it in a separate pass. I'm talking about for scoring sessions, you know. So, you know, in a concert setting, obviously there's nothing you can do. In a classical session setting, nothing you can do. If it's the London Symphony, you're going to be okay. But if you're trying to get stuff done fast and with the least amount of error uh, by just pure brute force um, session recording, you want to have all the cards stacked in your favor. And that's one thing. You Basically, any mistake or anything you want to do to change any instrument that leaks heavily like that, you will not be able to. You'll be permanent, it'll be in every mic, it'll bleed into every mic in your session. You will not be able to change that aspect. Might not even be a that big of a deal to you, but your mixing engineer is gonna be very upset. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. So just do it as a good practice, you know, it's just professional, you know. Get everything so that you can highly manipulate. Mixing engineers love it when they can do anything. Yes. The more control they have, the better. It's, it's, it's the worst when they get in there and they're like, okay, well, we basically have about 20% play in this whole thing. Right, Because right. everything's bled together, you know. You know, how about like when you get a, a drum kit recorded and and there's basically no difference between any mic. It's just everything's bleeding. They, they put 414s on everything. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And everything's just bleeding with everything. It doesn't sound good, you know? Although, for, that would be nice. It would be a very expensive way to mic a kit. <laughs> you better get a good player on blow it. Blow up the diaphragm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Dallas Dwight uh, asks, can someone recommend a resource to learn more about networking multiple computers together to create a stronger system? Yeah, so... I mean, I just, I, I don't know much, but basically you, you want to know like how your main computer interacts with um, the secondary computer. So you could figure out about like virtual PCs and virtual Macs in case, you know, your DAW computer is a Mac and your um, secondary computer is a PC, which is generally the preference because it's just cheaper to do PCs, doing all that like kind of like slave work. And so figuring out how to interact with the two, like a virtual PC is nice, and then, um, or a virtual Mac, I guess, and then, you know, just going from there, running running most of your samples off of that, uh, connecting it with, you know, top of the line, high speed, you know, like cables, like, I guess Thunderbolt or USB 3 is, mm -hmm. is typical for that. Now, if you're going to do it over the network, uh, you know, make sure that you get a switch that's at least gigabit. They even make 10 gigabit now. Um, you might even check out if the prices are coming down on fiber optic. Um, you want to make sure that the switch itself, that the switch is a hub. It's like a USB hub for Ethernet, okay, or network communication. That's what they call a switch. And you connect all your different computers or you, your office, your studio, all together with this switch so they can all communicate with each other at the highest speed possible and share files and that whatnot. Um, and you want to make sure that that switch supports something called jumbo frames, and that's 16 kilobyte communication packets. That allows packets to be sent such that it has enough room to cover overlapping information so that there's not a gap. And we'll give you an audio dropout or a glitch, what you might perceive as a glitch is an audio dropout. So you want to make sure it has jumbo frames. Um, so that's one tip that you might want to have in when you're networking your computers together is that at the fundamentally you want to make sure your computers are at least gigabit connected and have jumbo frames. At that point then you know you can run your your VEP, your VSL uh, Vena Ensemble Pro module to be able to host and what we used to use is one called a wormhole. You know it's <laughs> the same technology but like to, to sort of wormhole funnel to your other computer and get audio back and MIDI and communicate them back and forth you can download buy and download VSL's VEP, which is a great tool to be able to host all of your plugins on an entirely different computer. But as a matter of fact, you can actually use it on the same computer, which kind of like is one of the ways that you should probably first master the whole technique before you start breaking it off into different computers. I mean, it's almost like if you're asking, how, how, do, I, how do I, you know, use multiple computers? It's like you're way not at that point yet Should where you didn't even have to worry about it. You know, let's see you kick ass with just one computer first. That would be really awesome. And you can. You just with 64 gigs and a very powerful computer, 
um, even like twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollar computer setup, you can have an extremely powerful blockbuster score level computer. Uh, it's just going to take you some weeks or months to put together your template with your libraries and all the balancing and stuff. But yeah, yeah. And I think the other issue to take into consideration um, is like synchronization with the clocks to make sure that they're, you know kind of dancing together at the right time and then you can do like printing and stuff like that when they're yeah. linked up like that yeah we used to do I mean uh, back in the days we used to have to make sure that each computer was synced to something called word clock it was a BNC connected uh, cable that you would connect between all your devices and it would make sure that they're all sort of running and you'd have one device be the master clock and it would be sending the word clock and, and that's more about just having like it sending out a 48 k kilohertz signal to everything that they're at the exact same yeah so you don't get like digital rate you don't get a like sub um like bit kind yeah. of sound information or anything because that that just leads to loss yeah yeah so now but now that's handled a little bit digitally but um if you had for example another machine set up for printing printing stems recording and printing stems and pro tools you would want that machine to play and record at the exact frame accurate same point that the ho the other computer that has the MIDI data and the audio tracks data that you're ex that you're that you're emanating, you'd want them to sync together perfectly every time, so that you can punch in information and it will not have a glitch of any kind. Um, and and you do that using something called MMC MIDI Machine Control. That's one of the best, most current ways to do it. Um, and, and higher end systems and higher end studios will still be using that word clock to make sure that all that audio hardware is connecting at the exact same rate. But that doesn't mean that you can't do something uh, error free and quite extraordinary with say three computers, um, you know, just starting at home with you know, a couple of powerful computers, maybe two or three thousand dollar computers. Uh, but again, yeah, you can get quite a bit out of just a single system. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now we got a, another question. Well, kind of goes towards my next, my next, uh, my next bit here, which is uh, Alan Silvestri has been posting a lot uh, about um, the techniques that he uses in order to uh, score films that he's kind of developed over the last 30 years um, and uh, that he's learned from as well. But um, he uses uh, some sketching techniques that we'll be uh, going over at the Total Scoring Mastery Seminar this summer. And uh, I'll be telling you a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Um, Kim Goldbranson was wanted to ask us all what what score is a favorite of ours and have you seen a movie and gotten blown away by the creativity of the score mix or use of surround in a scene if so what movie scene hmm. interesting well you know there's um a funny this is probably not at all what you're <laughs> asking but uh, I, was, right. I was listening I'm, I'm a trumpet player so i was actually listening to uh, al hurt's version of uh, the green hornet theme um, which is a really, really cool theme song. First, nice. um, it is. In this case, I think he's kind of like a comedy superhero kind of guy, um, and it's just, it's just really crazy. Um, you know, it's, it's energetic. Um, it's difficult to play, and there's a little bit of a reference to uh, Rimsky Korsakov in there. So, you know, all, all things to like. Yeah, yeah. That's one of your faves, yeah. Yeah, it's it's just kind of funny and fun and exciting and yeah. memorable for sure. I wonder if Kim's asking in the context of like cinematic surround mixing strange, you know, using the uh, stereo, the imaging or something, you know. I do know that I, I believe it was Thomas Newman's Green Mile uh, used the center channel in, in some particular way. I think it was a violin solo or a Duke solo or something. And it went into the center channel. And uh, that was uh, kind of groundbreaking for the time. But, you know, we've went over this before in some other uh, episodes. Um, you don't need to play too much with uh, the stereo image unless, you know, I mean, that's got to be something that, you know, you're coordinating with the mixing and dubbing stage. 
because uh, they don't want to be playing with the stereo image much either. I mean, there's, there's, they've even done experiments where they have the dialogue when somebody's on the left side of the screen coming from the left speaker, and 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 then they, you know, studied the statistical results of the audience, and the audience was completely taken out and, and, and didn't understand what that was. It just doesn't seem right. It just, mm -hmm. And the reason is, it's because the dialogue that's in the film, it isn't real. It's storytelling. It's like coming down from the hand of God, but the God is the storyteller. Yeah. But, and so it shouldn't really come from any place except some direct socket connection to your brain, yeah. right? Well, it's like when you dream, you know, everybody talks, but it's not them talking. It's you speaking to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, in the dream. So that's kind of the. I feel like that's same the concept, same experience. Yeah. And this, and, and to talk about the surround stuff, it reminds me of, um, like the early '50s. You had two things that were really exciting. It was um, the actual stereo imaging with like RCA, and then uh, Jello. Jello came out, and that's kind of a new thing. And what you got with both of those at the very beginning of their existence was everybody was testing the limits. You know, so you got ham salad with jello in it and you had green beans with jello and then right. you had albums where they were doing left and right stuff so they were you know it'd be like music here and music here and it was kind of this gimmick thing and then you know they were just going crazy and after a while that just died out because the novelty wore off of stereo imaging and it you know just become became this bore I, I almost say like boring thing and now it's just another tool in the toolbox, you know. So people aren't going really crazy with stereo imaging or surround because the novelty is worn off and what you need is strong storytelling more than anything. And those effects are not as powerful as you really think they would be. Right. Yeah. Um, Kyle, you uh, had something that you wanted to bring. Yeah, yeah. I figured, you know, the whole kind of end game release. Uh, yesterday and everything like that. We would kind of have a oh Avengers, yeah, for the Avengers, yeah, the <laughs> Marvel there, you know, and uh, Alan Silvestri, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But to have kind of a just kind of a topic of just discussing maybe what's what are some of your maybe favorite kind of superhero movie scores, ones that really touched you, ones that really stuck out to you, or ones that you kind of think laid more of the groundwork for kind of what we expect today when we go to say see you know Avengers Endgame. We haven't seen it yet, so no spoilers in the comments. Um, <laughs> but. Um, I mean, it seemed to be kind of a cool topic, kind of a fun topic. Uh, Did you hear that there was a kid in China, I guess, like, beaten up outside of a theater, like, pretty badly because he had told the spoilers to, oh, the, to the line, to the audience oh. line? You know, it's interesting, uh, just on the topic of spoilers, I was reading that spoilers were not actually that much of a thing until very recently, and, you know, most people going in to see The Empire Strikes Back knew that Darth Vader was Luke's father. Oh, come on. And they just... Well, I don't you know. You probably heard about it. Really? Yeah. I didn't and then no, they, I never actually don't know. And then uh, they would go in anyway and still enjoy People the were movie. so polite back then. They're like, oh, yes, and Darth Vader is his father. You know? He's like, oh, oh I'll have thanks, to go Mom. see that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go check that out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but maybe that's the, the conspiracy theory. No, 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 no. Ah, da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's what does. So with, I was going to say just with like social media with kind of that I think that's why it's become such a you, you can't pull up Facebook now when there's a movie release and you're just, you're just scrolling through and you'll see like just a meme and you're like what is what does this mean oh, oh right. no like it just yeah. the whole end, you know and I think I'm starting to see something with cheeseburgers have you started to see this uh, I don't know if I have not no I, don't oh, know if has a, I saw Alan Silvestri he's a friend of mine he and posting just, him and his wife eating some cheeseburgers on the road and I felt like the way they said that it had some something something to do with the Avengers. They no, said does. He, they said something we like we we like cheeseburgers too. Maybe maybe I don't know, go to their Instagram account. Maybe it has nothing to do with it. Like, we're That's gonna watch so the Avengers, funny, you know. Yeah. And there's gonna be nothing to do with the cheeseburgers. Yeah, I'm uh, like, oh, they were just they they like cheeseburgers too. But uh, yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, maybe there's something at the end of the film like let's all go out for cheeseburgers. So <laughs> just give Thanos a cheeseburger. Like, all right, I'm done. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you'll you'll know why. Um, but back to your question. Yes. Um, I think the uh, Wonder Woman theme song yeah, just was, recently has been was fantastic. That kind of uh, energetic, driving, biting, quasi electric guitar, electric cello thing, and then just the heavy hitting drums. It has that exotic appeal, you know. Like Wonder Woman is this Amazonian monster, just like flying through, you know, the world, and it's just screaming behind her, you know, almost like a sonic boom, you know, like a that tearing sound of the jet passes by you. That's what I heard in that cello sound I felt like it was interesting too because as even though it was I mean it wasn't really like a uh, 
a certain period piece in a way. I mean, it was. I mean, you know, but I think it really actually had a great backdrop to that kind of to that World War One sort of just feeling to just that intensity and that sort of that craziness. And I, th- I do. I think it just kind of it was much more of obviously a modern piece in its own right. But I think it just fits so well with that with that picture and such. But which picture was that? Um, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Oh, the recent Wonder Woman. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So that's like your favorite uh, comic book movie? Yeah. A yeah. soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, besides the great story writing and, you know, the, the way they developed the characters and they got away from the, you know, the nihilistic, nothing can be good and no hero is truly great kind of thing. They got away from that. Um, I think just the music was very fresh. Um, they did some of the period thing for a while, but they also did this lushness and then, of course, the this weird... It almost that that tone of that cello felt like this metallic. Yeah, it, it felt like a new element that had been discovered. Did, I know, think just the way it like vibrated at, mm. at you it was very exciting. Yeah, um, just the actual quality of the melody, and then it has this you know this weird janky kind of non harmonic t- uh, melody. You know, it's got all these weird accidentals, and it's it's very cool. It's not. It, it's very much a hidden, advanced society kind of sound, which is what Wonder Woman was. Right, that very, like, it's very upfront, but still very subtle in its own way. Yeah, so. very exotic. Yes. I, I'd have to go, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a Danny Elfman, huge fan, so uh, a little biased, but I do, I love the Batman, the 1989. Um, oh, awesome. Score. That's yeah, for yeah. me, I mean, I think that in and of itself was such a groundwork for what was kind of expected of superhero films in the future. Uh, especially throughout that I mean there really weren't too many uh, which is kind of funny I feel like throughout because like, that came out in 89 and then 90s I mean you obviously you had the Batman and Robin and Batman Forever we won't talk about this um, <laughs> no god but I mean <laughs> definitely not in the realm of best comic book m- m- movie comic book hero movies of all time no. that nipples it, deploy yeah right <laughs> if, I mean if I can I make a suggestion about that. <laughs> if we could hire Arnold again as Mr. Freeze I mean I'm all for it um, the puns alone were just why don't you make like a dinosaur and freeze <laughs> <laughs> Something I. Uh, that probably was a direct quote, actually. Um, so, some but, other aspects of the Batman score that blew you away. For me, I, I loved it because it was. Uh, I mean, really, I mean, he, he, Tim Burton and Danny Elfman. Uh, Tim Burton was the director of that, I guess. Um, they really did kind of revive Batman in a way when they did that movie and that soundtrack because they, in fact, they used his same five note uh, theme, his five note motif for the animated series that came out just a few years later. It was ninety three, I believe. The animated uh, Batman cartoon, which I grew up with, that was that was one of my all time favorites. But it was such a, like I said, it was just such a, such a groundbreaking theme because you had all these orchestral elements, but at the same time they really played with dynamics. So you have this huge, say, crescendo come right down to just these, these very tiny triangles or very small bells kind of going oh, off yeah. the distance. And then it builds right back up again to this huge sudden kind of crash. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, such a big departure, too, from the Adam West Batman. Right, you know, but you know, it's, it's funny you mention that because okay. when I go back and I listen to it, I when I hear those subtleties and those changes in dynamics, I almost get that same feeling. That da da da, or he punch a guy and pow, you know? It was all, exactly. It was kind of like he, like he was doing, like he was kind of reflecting it in a way, a much more so serious, like a slower, tone. mature way. It, exactly. He was, he kind of adapted that, you know? And it's so funny because it's such a stark difference between, obviously, that Batman and the, you know, 1960s Adam West Batman. But he's still, obviously, I'm sure he grew up with that. So he kind of wanted to, you know, hey, this is a much more authentic, real, you know, dark Batman. But. You know, it's kind of adds to his elements, and I think it just played so well too with just uh, Jack Nicholson's as a Joker, that character, because obviously he's such a you know, you'd have breaks in the in the score where it's this dark, ominous kind of mood, and then carnival music kind of kicks in, and it's the circus kind of Cirque, Cirque du Soleil, Cirque du Soleil kind of thing, mm. and but it fits so well. It just the whole thing was just so seamless. Um, I'm not really going to talk about the, the Prince version just because I'm not asking <laughs> for it. It's still very good. It's just very poppy. It's, it was interesting is they wanted uh, Danny Elfman to work with Prince. They wanted them to both. Well, that would have been a good idea, I think. Danny Elfman was he was very much I think Tim Burton and him. Their quotes were like, "We're not doing commercial films like Top Gun." So it's for us. Like to them, they were like, "No, that's, okay. that's a you know." But I'm, I I kind of would have liked to see how they would have kind of melded. I think Prince. was... That's why I really like about James Horner. Yes, uh, he was always doing kind of cross genre collaborations with contemporary artists like every album yeah and uh that was was something that he did that he did 
better than anybody. You right. Know? Right. It brings a it yeah. brings a whole unique. You have to kind of take into effect now this whole unique style that isn't yours. You know, and how you're going to yeah, collaborate. I know, uh, John Williams did that too. He has a lot of albums where it's someone singing one of his songs. You know, e- even like uh, what is it? Artificial Intelligence has a vocal version of the track. You know, like the most heady kind of intellectualist film has this pop singer in right. it as well. You know, yeah. Which one? Which uh, pop singer? I don't remember. Not sure. Okay, no, that's cool. I just I just enjoy it for the rest of it, which is so funny. Why, why I point that out because he's doing it even on a film that doesn't really make sense to do. It. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. um, Edward, by the way, says uh, good Arnold impersonation. <laughs> that was very good. Yeah, it was oh, awesome. Thank you. It was uh, on the fly. Uh, let's see, um, Mitch. I want to say hi to you. Thanks for thanks for uh, posting a comment there. Um, yeah, and uh, let's see if there's any other topics here. Boy, there's we've got quite a few topics, but I'm not sure how we're going to string them together. Um, I will. Oh, I do want to say first that my favorite uh, superhero score, or yeah, I guess they're superheroes, comic book uh, superheroes, whatnot, is uh, the way that music was used in the film The Watchmen. Oh yes, yeah, and yes. and mostly because you know I'm pretty, um, I'm a traditionally trained classically trained composer but um, very open minded um, I was talking with Herbie Hancock who is a family friend and uh, he told me one time you know it's important for you to think outside of the box you know I think it was 11 at the time and, and he said but not inside a bigger box you know <laughs> okay open your mind you know and so even though I'm very classically uh, trained, um, I'm pretty sick and tired of orchestral music <laughs> I know what you mean. being yeah. used in films. I know what you mean. Yeah, it's uh, it is, it can be quite tired, you know, right. especially if it's just this same approach. I'm really into fresh approaches, you know. So um, it doesn't matter if you write a different theme. It, if it's still the same approach as another one, it's, it gets a little bit tiring to me, you know. So in the Watchmen, um, I think it was just such a brilliant example of you know they would just put all these pop songs and all yeah. these dramatic scenes. I think they even had a Philip Glass piece during this like sequence where what's his name, Doctor Mercury or whatnot. Dr. Oh, Doctor uh, Manhattan. Doctor Manhattan goes to Mars, you know, to meditate, you know. <laughs> I love, I love that. I love just that. to get away from things for a little while, you know. What about that use? Wasn't there a moment in there? Where they were like flying the helicopters and they referenced oh, that yeah. really the, uh, the Valkyrie, the flight of the Valkyries. Yes. Okay, yeah, from Wagner. But that was kind of an apocalypse. Now they were trying to sort of rewrite history. Yeah. They had Nixon like as if he wasn't impeached or whatnot, okay. and like he was still president. And yeah, I was going to say like, War. do you think that's like too much of a trope? Or I mean, the, there's probably a worse song you could play I for think, Vietnam. I think they could have put something else there. Um, like um, Robert Zemeckis did in Forrest Gump for the same war there was a lot of songs that they were able to use and put there and still give you that flashback to like Nam you know (laughs) that quality Um, but I think why he chose that in particular uh, what's his name Zack Snyder uh, chose that because he wanted to create a pivot point I think to say like let's rewrite the exact same thing except now I made the movie Apocalypse Now or whatever and this is a different direction in history that things were so maybe maybe that's why he had to do that it's hard to say without removing it and replacing it it had to be very very obvious yeah but there's like uh, there was other scenes too which used um, oh uh, the sounds of silence uh, from uh, Garfunkel and so, yeah, I think for me, that my my uh, one is the Watchmen. My only problem with the Watchmen movie, basically, if the Watchmen movie hadn't ended in like a white, stark Antarctic, <laughs> you know, place, uh, then it probably wouldn't have kind of fallen so flat. It just c- cinematography just sort of suddenly became just muted and boring, you know. And they did that with the music as well. They're like, oh, instead of a song, we're just doing score now because this is the final conflict. It's true, yeah. You know, no, bring me some, you know, you can say the same thing narratively with some song that you yes. can pull out of your pocket. 
and um, they didn't do that, so it kind of died. I had the same problem at the end of Inception. It was like they finally got down to the third level of the dream, and movies are supposed to get more and more and more interesting and exciting, and yet the cinematography closed off and became muted and all white in and the then snowy environment. It was just risen with concrete. It was a James Bond redo, you know? You think if you're that far down into the subconscious that you start seeing weirdly symbolic things oh, appearing you know like faces on yeah. trees and yeah. stuff oh yeah you yeah, yeah. Escher like things that yeah. are just not the way they're supposed to be yeah like yeah. E- like non-Euclidean geometry yes. and space and this you know weird warping and stuff yes multiverse would have been much more interesting you know abstractions yeah, yeah. There, there was a that t- wasn't it that Twilight Zone movie that was a little better about it the, uh, the there was a kid who okay. kind of ran a horror house, but it was all cartoons, and so right. they used that as the vehicle. He was his family captive because he had some special powers, and but he was immature. Yeah, so the cartoon was the vector for introducing those strange, wacky yeah. things. So I think that's, that would have been better in Inception if they could do that in a serious way with kind of a psychedelic right. approach. Yeah, because I, I do, I think they went more to that, sort of that realm of like, how can we shift, like... The buildings to exactly, you know what I mean. Where how yeah. we make the actual structures see, just seem like they're just out of place. Where yours coming from? Yeah. How do I? I really want to see like what does the conscious yeah. can kind of hold. Once just once you can get down to that kind of level. Even a uh, Rick and Morty, even though they did a derivative episode on it, they were a little more focused in <laughs> the the meaning of the different levels because it became um, representations of you know base primal carnal desires right. of the mind and you know kind of repression of certain things. So it actually had like some kind of architecture that mirrored, you know, the psychological effects of the mind. I, I, so, it's been a while since oh, sorry, one. Oh, I'm just, in, Inception was, uh, was very interesting, and it certainly it caught on with a lot of people, yeah. but it, you know, it did not define with authority the actual approach um, to exploring the mind, because it was so bland. Right, exactly. Way. You know, like, what is it? You, you're falling in a van and you get wet, so your dream is raining. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's they, as deep as they went. It was a very, it was a very surface level. <laughs> you know? They really didn't try to. Well, pretty damn cool, is it? Because the reality was like a magnitude of time slower in each oh, level. Oh, it's down. cool. And they did like one extra thing with the. Uh, yeah, with the city folding atop itself. Yeah, well, and and the staircase that kind of ends, but it was so bland. Right. It, it could have embedded itself into the actual scene instead of being um, focus points, you know, in an art museum being the uh, pieces of art on the pedestals. It could have been the entire museum itself. Yeah. Now, um, Mitch, I mentioned you earlier, uh, he was asking about, he's starting to pitch for projects and he, he wants to get his first gig. He wants to hear opinions on reels, like one reel or mini, uh, how many total tracks, what kind of genres, length, etc. Mitch, if you haven't taken uh, the course Demo Reels over at the Film Scoring Academy, we have it on sale right now until the end of the month, a 30% discount. If you go there to filmscoring.academy, check out Demo Reels, use the promo code SPRINGSCORING with no space to get 30% off of that. Additionally, you can apply any kind of... uh, courses that you've taken, uh, that you've purchased at the Film Scoring Academy to this summer's Total Scoring Mastery Seminar. Um, That's just going to be an epic six-day incredible event uh, this July, and you can attend from anywhere in the world. Or if you're in L.A. uh, or can be in L.A. for any of the days, you're welcome to come in and uh, participate and be a part of the uh, Total Scoring Mastery uh, six day epic super seminar that's 25 years of my experience and the other speakers and panelists being put together to give you the most relevant cutting edge experience information and wisdom and knowledge that you really can't get at any school at this point and stay current and relevant you know so check that out at uh, events.filmscoring.academy we'll also post in the link here it's called Total Scoring Mastery if you happen to register for that by the end of this month uh, you'll be able to get one of the best early bird discounts that there is and I'll tell you right now the, f- the next few people that go there and register will get an extra 10% discount if you use the promo code TSM pre-order so that'll give you another 10% off So, uh, yeah, it would be great if uh, some of you would show up to that. I'd I'd love to help you all out. Um, We're all going to be there, and uh, it's going to be one of the the best uh, educational experiences that you could possibly get. Awesome. Absolutely.
Well, thank you everybody for showing up today, and we're going to see you next week. That was episode 13. Have a good one. See you guys.